It's Tuesday noon for August 1st, 2006. On today's show, Bob Ham joins us to talk up the state of education. What is No Child Left Behind doing to our kids in the classroom? How do the bad seeds of violence, drugs, and bad teachers influence the common perception of today's classroom teacher? What's a community to do with underfunded schools? All that and more today on Tuesday Noon. Welcome back. Another edition of Tuesday Noon. Tuesday, it's noon. It's good to see you all here it's good at the round here. table. Again. Great Jamie Whitley here. sitting Thank here you. on my left, on my right, the lovely and talented Mary Bradbury Jones. Hello. Uh, welcome to you. And our guest today, esteemed guest. Look, at he's, he's practically esteemed. steaming across the table yes. right there. He's uh, dressed so speak. sharply. He's nice. uh, is, is Bob Ham. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do somebody want to tell us about Bob, or do we want well, Bob to do I that himself? I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, who is Bob? What about Bob? What about Bob? Bob, would you like to tell us a little bit that about that line? Yourself? Has never been used before. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, never heard let's that see. Show. Never <laughs> have. No. Never have. Um, well, my current position is uh, campus chair for education at the University of Phoenix in Oregon, and uh, we have 75 students in our program right now who are becoming K-12 teachers. And uh, born and raised locally here. I went to Lewis and Clark College and things like that. So, um, wife, three kids. So, Bob, welcome. Thank you for sitting down with us today. Thank you. Uh, today, uh, the topic is education. And I don't, I don't even know where we're going to go with this thing. I think that uh, I was talking to Jamie in the elevator this morning, and it hit yes. me that I've got two kids. And apart from that, you just uh, apart that from the before. shock of realizing oh that gosh, I have two I kids... Did. Where'd they come from, honey? <laughs> uh, it hit me that uh, I'm going to have to send them to school. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and why? Why, oh, why does it scare me to think about sending these are kids really to scared? school? I am well, scared. What kind of things? I mean, I, yeah, well, what do you hear? You? What are the things that you hear about going to public school today? Uh, crime. Crime. Lots of crime. What else? Bad teachers. Bad teachers. What else? Well, I don't know. I got put in detention all the time. So, so bad Jamie, students. People, yeah. influences like you. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. That could be true. Yeah. Drugs, bad students. Yeah. Students, I mean, and it's one of the things that we see coming, coming into the classroom as teachers is students that are more or less prepared than they were, you know, five years ago. Are they more or less prepared? Are they less prepared? Do they write as well as they did five years ago? Do they, are they coming out of high school with the, with the core skills that they need to succeed in the world today? Uh, do they have to go through metal detectors just to get into the classroom, the, the high school level? Are metal detectors moving into the elementary school? I mean, those things are the flights of sort of Yeah, here's uh, what I think is happening. That, here's what's happening. And, and my orientation, quite frankly, is defending public education because I believe in it very, very strongly. Uh, the, all the items that you've mentioned are isolated issues that happen in some places. It's true. Uh, I think most of the um, public schools are doing fabulous jobs. There are miracles that are happening every single day in classrooms. And you have, uh, you know, the, the question has come up, and even Pete, you mentioned, alluded to this, and that is, are kids writing as well as they were? Are they thinking as well as they were a few years ago? I have to tell you that the writing that I see from adults is not so good. I mean, we have some older people who can write in Palmer handwriting, but uh, not necessarily being able to speak correctly or write correctly. I think that it's a uh, it's kind of a national trend to bash schools because it uh, it's a convenient uh, scapegoat, and people like to do that. No Child Left Behind, the legislation that came out of the uh, White House and the Department of Ed. I think its intentions are pretty good, but I think it's, they're well-meaning, but it's totally misguided. And I don't think you have anything to fear going and uh, sending your kids to public schools. I think there are fabulous teachers out there, and they do perform miracles every single day. Miracles, okay. What about uh, the classroom size getting bigger? I mean, I look at the, the, the overcrowded classrooms. Yeah. I look at the schools that are in my district, mm-hmm. and I have an opportunity to send my kids to, to an elementary school that is, that is fantastic, widely regarded as, as one of the really, really good ones. And then the high school is one that was a result of, um, of other high school closing. You know, it became one of those giant sort of planetary high schools where all the other ones get bust in, and they're Thousands and thousands and thousands of students at this school. No, there aren't thousands and thousands. Well, I, thousands I think there are close to 100,000 students at this I, school. I think so. Maybe 150. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I don't know and there, are, and there are 200 teachers. <laughs> I'm not sure how many. And so I don't know how you mitigate yeah. that, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Ham. Well, here we go but with class the size the gross increasing. exaggeration. Is it hard? Yeah. Class size is yeah. getting bigger. Yeah. Class sizes are getting bigger, and it is true. And there are some masterful teachers who can uh, have a class of 38 and 42 students. That's it's really huge. The largest class I ever had when I taught high school was uh, 36, and that was really, really tough. You don't get the discussions. You don't get you know those. So kinds why of should I send my in. kid there? Well, it's interesting. If you send to your kid to a private school here in the Portland area, uh, you're going to find roughly the same kinds of numbers in a lot of cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I'm a firm believer that teachers need to be licensed. At least it shows they've gone to some schooling to have pedagogy, to have methods, and those kinds of things. So do we have a lot of the not. private schools do not require? Really? They have to have a certain percentage of teachers who are licensed, but they don't require everyone to be licensed. And that would scare me. Huh. That would scare me a lot more than sending kids to public school. I have three children and. You know, I'm really very much in tune with what's going on in their lives and that type of thing, and I want the very best for them. And I, in my local district, I had absolutely no problem whatsoever sending them there. How so, big was the school? Well, primary school, uh, I'm guessing class sizes were anywhere from 25 to 30, which is big, especially for the early grades. Middle school, I'm, these are off the top of my head, and I have been in the classrooms, but it's probably... 28 to 32, high school. It depends on, you know, if you're going to offer Japanese 4, for example, you're not going to get 32 kids taking Japanese 4. There's a trade-off there. So that class may have uh, 16 kids, and one of my kids was in a class of 16 in Japanese 4. That means the English class or social studies or or math class is going to have to be uh, 38 kids, perhaps, in order to, uh, to make it possible to work that schedule. So does it become, because Pete, I'm thinking about you, and, and I have two kids and I've had the same conversations and thinking about it, maybe it's partly an issue of, well, my kids are okay, but I don't know about those kids over there and I can't vouch for that group or that group or that neighborhood or whatever. And I, I don't want to be a part of that and, you know, guns and crime or whatever, so I'm not going to let my kid go over there because because of somebody else. And then if everybody has that same attitude, then... You know, it's, it's this fear-based of, well, yeah, our public schools suck because of everybody else, right. and, and it becomes self-perpetuating. Yeah. Well, this is a corollary to this, to what you just described. Uh, in one high school where I was an administrator, we made the very difficult decision to uh, cut out home economics. Um, teacher was retiring, and kids simply were not signing up for those classes anymore. And there was a bit of an outrage by the community that uh, we're cutting home economics. We had cut wood shop. We had cut auto mechanics several years before that. And what's so interesting is that people are very interested in having those kinds of classes available for other kids, not for their own kids, but for other kids. For their own kids, they want nothing but their college prep, uh, you know, uh, and, and all those kinds mm-hmm. of classes. AP and yeah, all Yeah, AP yeah. classes, uh, advanced placement, and all those other classes. But they're always looking out for other kids, and yet those other kids are not signing up for those classes. Huh. So it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, I think. Speaking of cutting classes, so here's a question. If what, And we tend to, because tax money isn't nearly as good as it used to be, and so we start cutting types of things like... Home ec, and, and we do. We cut PE, and we cut band, and those sorts of things, and we really get it down to this core. Do we lose something when we do that? Oh, absolutely. I, I grieve when I see uh, the arts, uh, band, art, uh, music, you know, the other musics, uh, being cut because that's the soul that feeds some kids. And it's just, you know, athletics will never be eliminated because there's so much support in the community for athletics. I mean, sometimes people judge their schools by the Friday night football score. You know, if they win, they're a good school. If they lose, they're not a good school. Uh, but I, I think it's really important to keep the arts because that, that draws some kids in. My third daughter, very involved in art, not uh, in uh, drama, uh, not as involved in athletics as my first daughter was, for example. And those two things, not that they ever were going to drop out of school, but those two things gave them kind of a soul experience, mm-hmm. if you will. Uh, that's why they became so involved in the school. Are those classes also good for people who maybe 
I mean, maybe I was forced to take an art class, but I never really was interested in it. I mean, does that have value for me as a student to, to explore those things? Well, it, it, I think it kind of depends. It depends at how open your mind is. I mean, there are seeds that are planted, you know, that analogy, and, and maybe as a 40-year-old you're interested in something that you did explore when you were 18 years old that right. really has been lying dormant all these years. And maybe that's I'm still looking for that dormant stuff. <laughs> well, maybe it'll happen it's next year. It's all still year. dormant. Maybe it'll happen next year. Yeah, don't count on it, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, the love here is just great. But, <laughs> you know, for a well-rounded education, what does it mean to be an educated person? Uh, knowing facts and figures. I mean, if you, if you know all the capitals of the 50 states, are you, you an educated person? Well, if I asked anyone in this room, what's the capital of New Jersey? And I, maybe people would know, but... You know, why should people on the West Coast know the capital of New Jersey? If you live in New Jersey, you need to know it, uh, that Trenton is the capital of New Jersey. But why would people out here need to know that? Is that real education? Or is it actually the ability to think, to process? There's this one... To create. Uh, to create. There's this uh, phrase, critical thinking, and some people totally misunderstand what that means. That Some people think it means to think negatively about everything you come across, which, of course, is not at all what it means. Critical thinking is to examine something and actually make some judgment based on logic, whether that premise, whatever it is, is valid or not. And I think if we can get our kids to learn how to think instead of just memorizing facts, you know, up to a point, you need to know the multiplication tables. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You need to know the alphabet. I mean, there's some things you need to know for sure. But let's get kids thinking about how to think. It's... It's you a know, complex task. It's an interesting yeah. comment. I just wrote an article uh, for a, a local publication. And I interviewed a guy. Uh, his name's Kurt Siffert, and he's a programmer. He's just an all-around good guy, and uh, and he uh, he runs. You know, he's a PHP program. He's a tech technology guy, right? He's a tech head, right? He also ha- is a, an accomplished musician and has a podcast that he offers every week of just uh, of improvisational piano. Uh, he also has a political weblog that has been featured on national uh, cable TV. It's referenced on MSNBC, on, on, on television. And, uh, and so I asked him about that very topic, about what does it take. Uh, you know, the, the focus of that conversation was to talk about technology and education and how do you broaden your, your educational horizons as a technologist. But what he said is, is for any field, it is not about what you know but your ability, your savvy with which you can create connections between right. them. And that's it. Right. Uh, and if you don't know excellent. something, know where to go yeah. to get the information. I mean, the Internet, a lot of people are thinking the Internet is the end-all and be-all. And the problem is I could put a website up that says that Harry S. Truman uh, was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And some little kid out of Kalamazoo is going to pick that up and think that's fact. Mm-hmm. You know, exactly. And so the Internet is not exactly your best source for Finding factual information, but uh, knowing but, how, but where knowing to look. how research rigor is right. is part of that. I mean, if if this kid sees one reference that Harry S. Truman was a signer, but knows how to find five other ones to dispute that, right? Exactly right. And is education somewhat uh, about preparing people for life in general? Mm. I mean, that's no. You know, okay, I don't think it is. I'm kidding. Oh, okay. it's a joke. But well, yeah, you know I, the. Uh, for example, in college, the thing that would amaze me, you know, people, you know, struggling to get through math, you know, algebra, mm-hmm. those kinds of things. And while there are certain fields where that's important, and, and part of that is helping in the critical thinking area, mm-hmm. but these folks would graduate with a college degree and couldn't balance their checkbook. You know, didn't know how to compare interest rates on, you know, different credit cards, didn't, didn't understand really the things that have to do with math and life that are in the end, vital in every aspect. Is that education's of job? I mean, I don't know. Uh, well, that. yeah, I would say yes, but I think the problem is, is that I could, I, from my own experience, my undergrad, my my uh, uh, elementary education was great. I feel like it was it was good. It sustained me. It got me into college. I did fairly well in college most of the time, and the one thing that it didn't do that I didn't get until grad school is make connections between those core skills, like. Why is math important to me? I was one of the kids who said, when am I ever going to use this? Exactly. If somebody <laughs> had showed me a checkbook and said, look at how this math plays a part. But here's another thing to and think I about. And I still can't balance my checkbook. <laughs> so you need a good calculator. Uh, one thing that needs to happen is that if connections are made for kids, okay, let's say 
You know, there's a real movement in this country to integrate a lot of curricula, mm -hmm. and I, I think there's some real value in that. However, if the teacher, what is that? What is that oh, what, I, what I mean by that? Okay, so if you take, I'll I'll take from my own experience. You have a high school, let's say, an American literature class, and you team it up with the U.S. history class. Okay, instead of those two being two discrete uh, classes, they are in, integrated, and you learn history along with literature at the same time. And what happens is this. I've seen this happen time and time again. The teachers actually find it fascinating, absolutely fascinating, as I, as I do. And as a literature major, and then later on coming onto history and seeing the connections, it was just so powerful for me. What's the powerful part of it is that I discovered it. It exactly. wasn't pointed out to me. And when things are just pointed out to you, and you don't discover it on your own, then it's another ho hum. Here's some more information. You're passive in the yeah, process. That's a good exactly point. right. Yeah. So uh, you know, the six period day has been just maligned all over the country. Of uh, you know, uh, in high schools where you go to French class and then you go to geometry and then you go to you know whatever, and nothing seems to be integrated. And I, you know, I'm not necessarily a proponent of the six period day in high school, where everything changes completely every 73 minutes or whatever it happens to be, but. I also think there's some value in having kids making connections. And, and one of my teaching experiences is I taught American Lit and another colleague taught U.S. History. We did not collaborate. We did not work with each other. But kids would come in and say, but that's not what Dr. Hunt said. He's in a what? I said, you've got to be kidding. And we would have these kind of intellectual debates via the kids and I think they all gained from that. And, and this other teacher and I never talked about it ourselves. And you haven't spoken since. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he's a good friend. But, uh, no, that's a really good point. It's kind of an interesting thing. And some kids never make the connection, and some kids never will make the connection. And then that's, is that better or worse? Well, that's obviously worse. You know, you hope they make some connections. Everything ties in together. I, too, was one of the ones, you know, how am I going to use math in my later life? Well, I, you know, I use geometry when I play pool, for example. Uh, I'm not very good at it. I wasn't very good at geometry. Yes, but, you know, been, yeah. it's, it's a connection. And supposedly, you know, trying to determine the height of trees, you know, all that kind of stuff. But how do you measure that? So you're a taxpayer. And I think this is, if you talked about Pete saying, well, I don't know if I want to send my kids to school because of all the things you see and read and hear. So then you're kind of fear-based, and then it becomes, well, our schools are doing a horrible job, so I'm not going to send my kids there. So what we need is we need to be able to measure how good they are. And measuring education has always been a real big challenge. Mm -hmm. So then we come up with, like, no child left behind and those sorts of things. Well, we're measuring everything, and can you really translate those skills you were just talking about into those measurements? That is so key, Jamie, because things like that are not measurable on a test. And that's what's that's the pity of NCLB. There is a there's a Harvard professor named um, oh his name escapes me right now naturally, but uh, he said you can't fatten the cow by continually weighing it. And by that he means if you're going to weigh and weigh and weigh the cow, it's not going to get fatter. If you test and test and test the kids, and so much academic time is taken away from uh, the school day to test kids, test kids, and they get weary of it. I mean, imagine, can you imagine if we subjected the adults in this building, all the people in this building, to yearly multiple tests, multiple tests during the year? How would people in in this building react. Well, there would be an uproar. People don't want to be tested over and over. Yeah, we're very willing to do that for first graders, second graders, on up to 12th graders. Well, then I worry we then are teaching to the test. Mm, exactly yes. right. Because you're well, measured on that, and then therefore you don't want to... Who is the school recently that... Shoot. I just heard the clip on the news. But so they, they had been recognized for doing very well, and now they're finding out that the teachers were giving the tests to the kids to study ahead of time. Oh, well, that's, that's unethical, and, and that's well, yeah, awful, but, a absolutely awful. But that's an example of, of, of a solution you know, right. driving something so much exactly that people right. will start to go, well, you know, here's yeah. what I'm going to do. And, and in this state, there are certain categories of schools, of, you know, very strong, strong, you know, exceptional, weak, all these kinds of names put on them. If you don't make progress, that is, if you don't improve from this year's third graders taking the test to 
next year's third graders. So if that next year's third grade class does not improve over the pre, you're, you may be considered a failing school. Never mind that those are different kids that are being tested. Never mind that maybe the kids just moved into the school last week. That doesn't matter. The school is still judged by those pure numbers. And that when you reduce human activity to pure mathematics, it just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. I mean, work. the same thing happens in the business sector, you know, being a person coming out of HR training and development. The, the issue we always struggled with was it was very difficult to put return on investment for leadership development, mm. return on investment in the soft skill type area of training and development. Those are things that you can't bring it all down to exact numbers uh, and put it to a dollar. And so that was the, the struggle we would always have of trying to convince people that in, you know, investing money in folks to develop them you know, will benefit the organization. Can I tell you it's going to save you $50,000? You know, mm. No, it's very difficult to, to put that to numbers, and, sure. and, and it would be the challenge. And, and so whenever there were financial issues, what's the first thing that, that gets cut Train. in business today? Training and development. Yeah. It's the and, very first thing. And in school districts, it's called staff development. It's the same thing. It okay. seems to be money that a lot of people see as wasted. What uh, people don't realize, you know, they hear their kid coming home saying, gosh, we had a substitute again. Well, where was that teacher? Well, the teacher was actually in some kind of a training workshop to improve his or her craft and the art and the science of teaching. And when are you going to do it if you don't? I mean, when kids... When teachers are gone from the classroom, kids are sitting there. They've got to have a substitute teacher. And so it, it's just a real dilemma. I, I want to go, it was Roland Barth, by the way, who made that statement about the cows. Uh, I want to go back for No Child Left Behind for a second. And that is, um, I think the overall intent of NCLB is honorable. It's mm-hmm. a good, what we want in our classrooms are teachers who are educated and trained. Who could argue with that? Absolutely. The problem is how it's been, you know, so there you have the basic premise. Every state then is to come up with its own ways to measure this whole thing. And then the feds come in and they say it's not right, it's not good, and it's not mathematical enough, and that's where the problem comes in. And it's just, and you see the private schools are not, don't have to worry about those kinds of things. They don't have to do all They're not that held testing. to no child left behind. Absolutely. How else would you measure it? What? what? Because... There are some schools that aren't nearly as successful Absolutely. as other schools. Absolutely. Oh, I don't doubt and that. So then people are, you're in that district, and that's the only school that you can go to, so that's part of it. So you're in a, in a community that doesn't have as much money, for example, and, and maybe you haven't got as many resources. The school's not really a top-tier school, and you're forced to go to it, and you're saying, my kid is not getting the education they need because this school is not acceptable. Right. How else do we measure and, and sort through that? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that, Jamie. I really yeah. don't. And that's a and I very legitimate question. It really is. It is. What do you do? First of all, there has to be a partnership between the school and the parent because if the parents are not reading to their kids, you know, in utero even mm-hmm. or in uh, age one, two, three, four, uh, there's a problem that the kid is already behind. If the parents are not reading to the kids, and one of the things that I tell uh, my students when they become parents, you need to sit the kid on your lap, have the kid physically turn the page. The parent shouldn't turn it, the kid should turn it, so he learns which way the pages go. And then you look at the pictures and you just talk about it and describe And th- if those things don't happen at home before school, um, there's a major problem there. Is, well, I'm sorry. Oh. what I was going to say is, you know, uh, being involved in SMART, what they say is that if the student, uh, the, the level of reading up to third grade determines really their quality of education from that point on because after third grade, all learning is dependent on their ability to read. Mm-hmm. And so that's crucial, that, that kindergarten to third grade of making sure that people have the right reading skills. Yeah, I haven't heard it specifically like that, but that sure makes a lot of sense. One of the problems is, of course, boys develop more slowly than girls do. And so the girls tend to pick up reading and that type of thing. Uh, boys are encouraged to, um, you know, throw balls and things like that. And, of course, girls should be doing those kinds of things and boys should be reading and stuff like that. But um, I, I just, you know, sometimes the reading, uh, you're absolutely right, Mary, that if they don't have a reading background, that's the way a lot of information is uh, is transmitted. And I, I think that's one of the neat things about the computer. It's forcing kids to read. I like that a lot. And uh, in classes that we have in this campus, for example, where some of it is online, I've noticed that people's writing skills actually improve dramatically when they have to write. 
when they have to write and, you know, if things are pointed out to them, you know, the overuse of the comma or some of these road signs that are in uh, sentences and they're not used correctly, it makes the, the car crash. It makes the uh, reader who's trying to read the post not understand what's going on. And so I'm, I like that. And your message isn't as strong because they're caught up in how poorly it's being communicated. Right, right. Yeah. It's kind of like eating a piece of chocolate cake, and if you crunch into some uh, raw dough uh, or baking, you know, a cake mix or whatever, it tastes awful. I mean, that's what happens when I see a piece, uh, either a word misspelled. You know, when I read a, a paragraph, I have a movie projector that's going on in my mind, and I, I think a lot of people do this. And then all of a sudden you come either to a misspelled word or a grammatical goof or a problem in punctuation. And it's like the reel stops running and I'm looking back at words again, trying to figure out what's going on in that, in that sense. That's an interesting one. Can I pick up? I, I was fascinated by you talking about people and, and learning to read in the third grade and mm-hmm. those sorts of things. And then it goes back to parents and time with that. So then you start making these connections because everything's connected. Then it's socially as a society do we uh, value that time with our children and those sorts of things Very good in our families and, and you know, uh, even go to businesses and, and whatnot? Are we spending enough time there to then allow our educational system to be successful? Or are we asking our educational system to give those things to those children that, that we didn't do as parents? Mm-hmm. Is that? I think that's a great assessment. I think that's exactly what happens in a lot of homes, that nothing is happening. And they're expecting them, the teachers to perform miracles when there's no groundwork, there's no foundation for that. I mean, I, I look and I can tell in each of my students, I can pick out a class and I can say, I can tell where your television is in your house. Is it in your living room? Is it in your kitchen? where everyone is gathered around the table watching television during dinner time. Do you ever carry on discussions? Do you have books in your home? Do the kids ever see the parents reading books? Or what? What is going on at home? And, you know, I have to say, if the television is the babysitter for kids, if they have it in their bedroom, I'll tell you, that's one thing. Television never appeared in my kids' uh, bedrooms because I think that's really a mistake. Well, that's it. I mean, we were seeing, we get these little emails. We've got a newborn, and so we get these parent center emails from Mm. parentcenter.com. And one of the studies that it was highlighting, not a couple of weeks ago, was uh, the number of parents who are putting televisions in the nurseries of their kids. I mean, if that doesn't set a, a, a tragic precedent. Yeah. Well, it helps keep it because it's very passive, so then you have a tendency to just sit and relax, and you don't have to worry about the kid as much, and so then oh, why go. not? And, and is some of that coming from the fact that you've got you know, two parents working, you know, you, sure. you come home from work at five o'clock. You're exhausted. You got di- you got to get dinner on the table. You got to do the baths, and and so I think that's probably to some extent Absolutely. playing a role. So the parents aren't as involved at home. They're also not leaving work to go help out in the classroom, room, read books to relieve the teacher. The different things that are needed, especially as the class size increases, you need more people in there assisting those teachers as well mm-hmm. in but order nobody, to make it. But nobody wants to be told they're a bad parent. So then exactly. what they say is, exactly. well, well, we're going to test the schools out right. and then figure that out because it must be your fault. Right. So then you're not really taking a whole lot of responsibility for it. Right. So what we're saying here is that schools, is that, that the transition we should be making here is schools towards supplemental education as part of the whole. Right. right. So what is it that we can do uh, culturally for, to help? To help uh, are there organizations out there that are helping parents to, to develop and understand these things? Well, they only mm-hmm. help as much as parents seek the help. You know, otherwise, uh, most people just go about their lives and, and they don't realize they're doing anything that might be ultimately harmful. So we're left here creating, what, the fourth or fifth generation of latchkey kids now? Absolutely, I think so. Uh, you know, one of the things that I encourage people to do is just before bedtime, after the bath, after dinner, after bath, uh, sit down with the kid for 20 minutes and read age-appropriate books with those kids. Uh, my daughters all uh, had, you know, uh, Ramona Quimby. That was the big deal. And I have to, I have to relate something. And I hope it, we have time for this. I had my second grader sitting next to me, and I was reading a Ramona Quimby book, and it was a chapter book. And that's a big rite of passage for second graders. You, you graduate to chapter books. Well, sitting on my lap was my kindergartner, who, of course, couldn't read yet. 
And so I was reading the story. I remember it was very late at night, and I was thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to get these kids to bed. I'm so exhausted myself. It was probably 10 o'clock, but I was just wiped out. And we had put off the reading for whatever reason, and so here we are reading. I ended at the chapter, closed the book, and my little kindergartner said, Daddy, can I read? And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to get these kids to bed. But I wanted to be the very best parent I could possibly be, so I opened up the book. And what she had done as she was sitting on my lap, she realized where my eye was going when we first turned a page. It was going to the upper left, and she followed along and figured out the blends, B-L-C-H-S-H, those kinds of things. And so she started on the new chapter, and she read the first two lines out loud and stopped at the word answered because it's too long. Yeah. And I said, Jackie, you can read. And she was so proud. She just graduated from high school uh, this last June, and she is quite a reader. I think, you know, that was that was the coolest parenting experience I'd ever had. That's cool. It really was. I read in one of the parenting magazines uh, where they do the suggestions, and there was a family that wrote in that said that they started very young, that Wednesday night was reading night, mm. and that's what the whole family did. The TV wasn't on. Dad read, mom read, kids read their books. They sat around in a room, and that that tradition stayed until they still do it. You know, yeah. the kids are off in, in college, but Wednesday's reading night, That's and it's cool. still and it's stuck. And those kids have taken it into we do their that lives. in my house. We really do, and and it's worked out really well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they complained because we didn't have it right at the get go. So you introduce it, and they're like, "No, this sucks," and I yeah. want to watch Disney Channel or whatever. <laughs> but but we have done that that one night a week, and mm. it's, it's usually cool, Thursday that's nights. Great. And we pull it off sometimes, but we're usually pretty good about mm-hmm. it. And we'll read, and we'll hang out, and no TV, and you know. Okay, yeah. sometimes I'll cheat. Everybody will go to bed, and maybe I'll watch something I recorded. But you know, like, that's we won't tell. I'm the parent, and I can do that. So. <laughs> Hopefully, they don't listen to this yeah. podcast. And yeah, realize yeah. What you're right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, but they Dad, can. I heard. You know, kids can also get uh, gift certificates to bookstores, you know, and that's spend an afternoon at a book, bookstore. Go to a library. You, know. you know what's really interesting is, is we have the Internet and all this kind of stuff, and, and so you say, well, what do you need the library for? Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. I mean, you take your kid to the library, and there's thousands of books to choose from, and and, and they get to explore things and see pictures and say, well, I want, a, I want this based on the cover and whatnot. Mm-hmm. It's very relevant. It's very, very powerful. cool. Very powerful. Uh, but we, the, the, it's kind of a dying thing, uh, really, unfortunately. Well, and now for us, I mean, it's a, it's, it gets to that level of being able to make connections. I mean, you go to the library, you listen to music, then you go read about the people who are making the music. I mean, there's just a just wonderful mm-hmm. facility yeah. for Excellent making those point. connections. So one, um, I guess, question I have for you is some of the things that you're hearing about public education now, and I think it's particularly tied uh, a little bit to No Child Left Behind, is that some of those really great teachers okay, who are teaching for the, the love of teaching, you know, it's, it certainly wasn't for a paycheck. It wasn't for summers off, you know, the type that, and they are so discouraged by what's happening that they're leaving. And they're saying, I'm done. They're going into private sector. I've had several friends that have left and said, I'm going into training and development within, you know, so I still teach, but in a different way. I had one friend, excellent fourth grade teacher, finally had had it, had it with parents, had it with it all, said, I'm going to become a librarian so I get to deal with kids. I don't deal with parents and I don't deal with the testing and all of that. I mean, what do we think about that? Do, is, is, is that really happening, or is that something being shoved in our face again to make us think that public education isn't working? Yeah. Well, I, th- I have seen statistics and studies that show that um, half of the teachers who enter the profession quit by the, in the first five years. Really? Which is really Whoa. an extraordinary yeah. statistic. Has it if always that's been true. that way? Or? Well, I don't know. I, can't, I couldn't tell you. But that's apparently the way it is in some areas, probably not everywhere, of course. Uh, and that's that's really hard. And you know, teaching is a really, really hard uh, demand. I was uh, reading an article from uh, National Education Association a few years ago that said that in the average day, a teacher makes ten thousand to twelve thousand different reactions to kids throughout the entire day. Well, no wonder that's. I mean, imagine how many that is. That's. That's quite a reaction. And to keep, you know, it's, it's balancing the art and the science of teaching. And if people have only the science of teaching and no art of teaching, then that's a problem. If they have only the art of teaching and just kind of, you know, wing it, let's see what's going to happen next without the science of teaching, that's going to be a problem. So, you know, I, in our teacher ed program here, one of the things I want to do is to state to people the reality is 
this is really a tough job. This is not sitting in a cubicle and answering the phone when it rings. This is a tough job. You're up in front, and but the rewards of teaching are extraordinary. And I have to, I know this will sound a little bit like bragging, but can't help Brag myself. Away. Okay, thanks. La- two weekends ago, I was invited to one of my first classes I ever taught, their 30-year reunion. Wow. And that was just cool. And here are all these people who are 40 years old, <laughs> and I was... <laughs> years older than that, yeah. not, not by many, but a few, and it was just so fun to see these, quote, kids, unquote, again, and, you know, I mean, that means, quite frankly, and being immodest right now, I had an influence on some of those people. Mm-hmm. I can tell you the names of at least five kids I saved from suicide. I can tell you their names. Uh, I helped raise some kids, yeah. and, you know, teachers get to be in those situations, and... Uh, you know, if you stay with it and you, you know, you love people and you, you realize that you may not see the fruits of your labor, uh, I mean, it's a grand profession. It's the highest profession there is as far as I'm concerned. Well, you know, when it gets to a point, I mean, I brought, I started this thing with all the, you know, grand fears about what it means to send a kid to, uh, to a public school. But really, you see the, uh, on an individual basis, you see the kids that we have over to babysit our kids now. And they're, they're bright. Mm-hmm. They're you know they're they're well socialized. They know how to, to they know how to speak to adults. You right. know they're polite. They're interested. They're engaged. They read, uh, and um, and and it really is an important part of the community. Mm-hmm. Even with a hundred thousand students, that school <laughs> is uh, it's an important part of our small community. There are yeah. ten good students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, but in all seriousness, and they all it babysit really for Pete. And, yeah. and so. <laughs> Vast, vast swath of people to yeah. choose from, uh, but uh, but the important part is is that that role in the community and the role those teachers are playing. I know those teachers are playing the community, and so you know I guess to get back to our you know the large classrooms, the large schools, you know what what are, how is teacher education changing beyond just you know yeah it's hard we need to tell them that it's hard. How is teacher education changing uh, uh, you know over these. Uh, last couple of decades. Well, uh, I can, you know. I can uh, again, going from personal experience, what else do I have to go on? Um, when I was in my teacher training program at a well-known college in this state, uh, I was aiming to be a high school teacher, and every class I took, every methods class, everything was aimed only at high school kids. In other words, I learned adolescent psychology. I learned nothing about child psychology, because child, you know, that means an earlier age. The programs, I think, around the state, what they're doing right now and elsewhere, they're looking at K-12 from babyhood, let's say pre-K, to 12th grade. And all teachers going through teacher ed program, even if they're, no matter what grade level they're aimed at, they're learning the whole spectrum of what it means to be a child. And to be a child in this country in this day is really tough in so many ways. There are so many pressures that are on children today that I certainly did have, did not have. In high school, we had some alcohol. I had never even seen marijuana. I didn't even know how to spell it practically. God, living in Oregon? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and it just, it was not very long after that that, you know, it, it hit the newspapers and everywhere, you know, and it's a big major uh, issue. But um, I think the teacher ed programs are more realistic. I think back when I was in a teacher ed program, it was very theoretical and kind of uh, woo-woo, if you will. And uh, But now it's kind of like this. For one thing, our teacher ed people are going into classrooms and doing observations. My teacher ed program, I had not set foot in a high school from the day I graduated from high school to the day I went in the first day for student teaching. I had never had any exposure whatsoever. Really? Talk about culture shock. It's like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? This is just too much. And now states are requiring 100 hours of observations before student teaching. 100 hours. That's a significant chunk of time. Yeah. And so they're also they're doing things. They're supposed to be getting a little, you know, asking cooperating teachers to, you know, have this group work a, a reading group and this group do something else, you know, those kinds of things that are built in as assignments in our programs. So I think that gives, it has changed vastly. One of the knocks on teachers is that they work their nine months and they have the summer off, and so really, I mean, they're really paid a lot, and 
you, know, you work a few hours in the classroom and you're done, and you get these big summer vac- great breaks and Christmas and all that kind of stuff. And so, I'm sorry, they're, they're paid. Them. They're paid a lot. Absolutely, I, I'm not. I don't personally believe that. Let me make sure you understand. But that is certainly that's something that you I, hear, you hear I, that honestly, I, I've never heard it. That's really? I, I've, I, so. Let me let me do it a different way. Maybe it's not that they're paid too much, but it's a very cushy job. Because people say things, well, I would like to be paid to only work nine months out of the year and have the summer off, or I would like three weeks at Christmas time, or I would like a spring break. And so it's looked at as kind of, in some cases, if you don't know education, you don't know teachers, it's it seemed pretty cushy. Is that mm. true? Well, is it cushy? <laughs> it is not a cushy job. And, and are you hiring if it is? Yeah, right. Um, I have been a teacher, administrator, and worked in the private industry. And only when I was teaching did I feel the need for some extended period of time off for rejuvenation. That also meant I had to take classes during the summertime that I paid for. It meant all sorts of things like that. Yes, it did allow me to go to Europe once in the summertime, I will admit. As, a, as an administrator, and, uh, you know, I think... But shouldn't I, a teacher be well-rounded and have some of those experiences? Well, you hope so. I mean, really, that's, yeah. that's the whole idea. There's, in this uh, state, there's a business education compact, and that's when some teachers are hired by Nike and uh, other corporations to do some summertime work in wildlife management, in whatever, whatever, you know. And so uh, those kinds of experiences are certainly used in the classroom. Um, I, I've never felt the need for rejuvenation except when I was a teacher in the classroom. I mean, it just took, it takes so much emotion and it's so draining and it's the best profession to go into and it's absolutely wonderful and all those things, but you, need, you do need that time off. Well, here, here's something that I think is interesting when they talk about the pay. Okay? You know, I pay probably on average 650 bucks a month for daycare for my two-year-old. And I have a pretty, I have a pretty reasonable daycare provider. I mean, most people think, "Wow, you're getting a good deal." Mm-hmm. Okay, so six fifty. So let's write what's a teacher. I mean, a teacher not only is supposed to be there to teach, but essentially they are taking care of that child for what's the average school day? Seven hours. Seven hours. Okay. Um, so they have thirty people in the class, right? Thirty times six hundred fifty dollars. For the month, what is that? I'm bad at math. <laughs> uh, Bob's a communication major, so, so that would right, be the but place what, to I go. Mean, a lot I of was, money. I, uh, yeah, and that's way more than what they're. Twice, so that's, you know, that's way more than their average pay. You know, on the yeah. average teacher salary of what thirty-five, thirty-eight thousand something. Well, something. average is higher than that right now. People start in Oregon; they start at about thirty-four thousand, thirty-three thousand, depending on if you're metro area or rural too. By the way, it's much less in the rural areas. Um, and then with a master's degree, maybe 35, 36. That's where they start. So the average is going to, and But, you know, teachers do get some benefits. I mean, they definitely, pay, definitely. pay for their insurance, too, and that type of thing that's not free. But, uh, you know, there are but some... But when you put it in that perspective, yeah. it's like, wow. I mean, you know, the daycare provider is, you know, blowing in terms of salary, the teacher away. And the teacher not only is supposed to, I mean, a daycare person, right, just watches them for eight hours, feeds them a little lunch, you know, <laughs> maybe play some games. But they don't sit and, and necessarily educate and teach. Good ones do. Good but ones I don't do. I don't think that that's the majority. Mm. So it's it's not only, you know, being responsible for the well being of these little folks for the next seven hours, but then also right, you're supposed to teach, you're supposed to perform. Teach to test. You know, you're supposed ensure to ensure their performances. You know, um, anyway, Wait. so that's that's my take on the yeah. the pay thing. I think that they are Grossly underpaid for what yeah. they did. Yeah. Well, we hope they're not teaching to the test because that's not that's not but a that, good situation. That, but that can be a realistic outcome for the problem. It's just, sure. you know, people will figure out how to work the system. I mean, humans have done that since the beginning of time. So eventually, people will figure out how to work the system and 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 survive, mm-hmm. survive in the new world. Mm-hmm. You know, the other challenge I think with being a teacher is that every parent thinks they're an expert. And the reason they think they're an expert is because, well, they've been to school. And B, they teach their children, so therefore they're an expert. And, and so really, and, and so then you have a class of 30, 35, and every single parent in there has a different set of expectations or requirements, and you're trying to balance all that and manage all that. Man, that's a tough job. It is yeah. tough. Yeah. Well, one of my friends, the ones I was telling you about, that left and became a librarian, uh, one of the, she had one year a student in this child was a pathological liar. I mean, she would go home every day and, and tell these huge lies about what went on in the classroom. Hmm. Okay, Now, most likely this crossed over into this child's life in all areas, so the parents had to have 
be aware that the child does this. Every night, my friend, about 9.30 at night, would get a raving, ranting phone call from the mother, calling her at home at 9.30 at night, trying, you know, saying, you did this and you did that. No, this is actually what happened, mm-hmm. to the point that they went, changed their number, got it unlisted, you know, and that was, I think, actually the final mm-hmm. straw when she finally said, I'm going to be a librarian. I am sick of parents. So what do we do in those, but what do we do in those um, districts and stuff that are really struggling. I, I have a friend who's a teacher who one of her kids uh, got suspended for uh, bringing fireworks to school, saying they were going to set the school on fire and those sorts of things. And, you know, he gets suspended for a couple of days, and quite frankly, the parents don't do anything. And then they turn around and, and bring them right back. I mean, that is that has got to be a tough situation to teach in. And, and I'm sure at some point, there's like, you either do it and you go through the motions and you lose all your soul, or B, you just say, I'm out of here. I can't do this. And what do we do in those districts? Because there are a lot of them out mm-hmm. there. I mean, I think in a lot of ways, we're really lucky in our area that we've got some really good schools. But what do yeah. you do? Well, it's, there are no perfect solutions for any of this. I, a lot of school districts employ, through, with the cooperation of, from the police department, say a security officer or whatever mm-hmm. you might call them. And I've watched this happen in several schools. And the the uh, resource officer, I think they call it, gets to know kids on a very different basis. I mean, he's not this tough guy walking around, you know, with this uh, bobby stick, uh, but he is actually getting to know kids. And those kinds of places are really nice. If it's a good police officer, it's they're nicely run. There's a lot of respect. I, I've also watched a couple of administrators who were disciplinarians there's this one I think of, uh, and he was just absolutely the best. I knew him both when I was a teacher and as a fellow administrator. And a grade book would be stolen. This is back in the days before electronic grade books. And within two hours, he'd have it back. He had such a network. And if you can find those kinds of people who really relate to kids on a very personal basis, I've watched that disciplinarian suspend a kid, and the kid would come up to him and say, Mr. Hansen, thank you. I thought, oh, this is the phoniest thing I've ever seen. What's going on here? But the kid realized, you know, because he had such a good relationship with this administrator, he realized that uh, he had done something wrong and deserved to be gone for a few days. Uh, you know, we have certain laws in Oregon. If you are, do certain things, you are automatically expelled by state law. Expulsion is a very serious situation. But what a lot of, what a lot of districts do, they, uh, you know, if you have a kid who just got in the wrong crowd and... He's expelled several, I mean, uh, uh, suspended several times, and you just don't know what to do with him. Uh, a lot of schools have kind of unwritten agreements with other schools, other districts, that the kid could come in, start over, brand new counseling, and get the kid back on, a, on the right track. And my school district did this with two neighboring school districts, and there's no, nothing written. It was agreements between the superintendents and that type of thing just to kind of help out these kids. Because kids who get in trouble all the time, I mean, there's a real reason for this. It's either lack of support at home. I mean, they're just, you know, all the issues we could bring up. Uh, and so I don't know. There's no real good answer to your question, Jamie. I, th- I think it's a very legitimate one. What do we do with schools that truly are failing, not just, you know, their scores didn't rise 2%, yeah. uh, but really failing. Losing that, accreditation. Thanks. Well, and then I worry that the school is a reflection of the, of the society that it's in or the neighborhoods that it's in, and so then that brings up a bigger social issue about what are we doing to help mm-hmm. not just that school, because you could pour a ton of money into the school, but it's, it's a bigger problem it's than exactly that. exactly right. And how do, we, how do we impact that entire area yeah. or, or generation or whatever it is? Right. And, those are tough social questions. Yeah. And, you know, some schools have problems. I know in Portland there are, um, I read recently, there are 68 languages. Imagine, mm-hmm. 68 languages. Where do you even begin? Where do you begin classroom? in a situation like that? Uh, Portland has needs that are unique to the state of Oregon. And if Portland School District fails, the whole state fails. Because it's, by, you know, it's the biggest district, obviously. And uh, it's got problems that it needs quite frankly, more money than a lot of the suburban or the rural districts need because no other district has 68 languages. Other districts have five. My district had three, you know, English being one of them. Of course, the majority one, but uh, so. Well, that's another case where numbers don't always tell the whole story. So there might be some kind of news article that says, well, this district spends this much per child and this other district spends X number per child. 
and how come you can't be that like right. that other district? You're, right. you're you're getting too much money. Right. Well, yeah, but we have 68 languages, and you have two. Yeah. We also have a situation between the public and, and private schools where public schools must take in all special ed kids. They're very expensive to educate. I'm not saying they shouldn't be. They must be educated, of course. But, uh, you know, private schools don't have to admit those people. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a real disparity in, uh, that's going on there. And I think, quite frankly, my children, having gone through public school and been having been near and working with special ed kids sometimes, that's enriching. It's yeah. not taking away. It's, it's enriching because in, that's part of society. In my grade school, it, when you were in fourth grade, all the fourth graders would go and, have, and help in the special ed classrooms, oh, good. and it was part of our day. Yeah. And you'd be assigned a student, and you'd be, you know, your job this week is to teach them how to button their shirt, yeah. you know, and you'd sit for an hour going over and, you know, and then the joy when, at the end of the week when they actually could, you know, do it, mm -hmm. and, and, and how fulfilling that was for us. Mm -hmm. But it was an integrated part of the program, and I think that was a positive one. You know, we have, uh, I think we've solved it. <laughs> So, <laughs> thanks. We just had to, so to answer question, plug please. you in. Uh, send them to school. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to send them to with school. With the other hundred thousand. Yeah, with the other hundred thousand. Yeah. Let them feel a part said, of that small community. You come up with a lot of problems, but don't have any solutions. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Ask the big questions and don't serve up any answers at all. But no, this has been a very educational for me, Bob. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, and I've been very good. And yeah. uh, we appreciate that. And uh, uh, find us online. Uh, at Tuesday12.com, our, our website. Uh, subscribe to the podcast if you're just listening to this off the site. You can find us uh, if you do a search on iTunes. Uh, and on the site, we've added all sorts of buttons down the, the right-hand column there where you can find uh, links to Yahoo and Google and any, any podcast aggregator that you're listening to or that you use, you can listen to us there. And send us an email. We'd love at, to hear from yes, you. we'd love hearing from you, especially if you, uh, especially if you disagree with Jamie or Mary, but with me, only <laughs> praise. Tuesday <laughs> email address is uh, Tuesday12 at gmail.com, and, uh, and I check that email address, so I will filter out all the stuff that doesn't involve praise for me or uh, comments for you, me. I thought you'd bring in the praise ones to show them around. <laughs> See, is See, See, that's right. That's right. Your head bigger. All about the promotion. So uh, thank you again, thank everybody. Thank you very much. And we Scott. are out of here. Thank you. That's Tuesday noon for August 1st, 2006. For show notes and all the blogging you can endure, head to Tuesday12.com. And don't forget to email us at our new address, the show at Tuesday12.com. We'd love to hear from you. Until then, see you next week on Tuesday noon.